If you would think back, put yourselves in 1770, that's where we're going to be. And we have a time traveler coming with us by the name of Parson John. servant comes up, if you have a hard time hearing her, then you give me a signal and I will have her speak loud. Thank you. And it, I am tempted sorely to preach. Oh, this is such a fine congregation. And then an offering. I heard about your offerings and you, you, you folk are, 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 are quite well off. Yes. And I suppose you're Methodist back there in the back, right? Yeah. But I, I am sure that you're not here to hear this old Baptist preacher prattle on. But you've come to hear my servant tell her tale of coming to this land. So I will not delay that any further. Maggie, will you come in? Maggie! Hey. I was just going through the... Get up here. She's Irish. Well, there was food out there, sir, that he left behind. I was just cleaning it up. Doing the work. Maggie, I want you to come here. I want you to stand here with this thing in front of you. And I want you to tell your tale of coming to this land. My tale, sir? Yes. We just had supper, sir. Let's not do that to them, shall we? <laughs> Maybe you'd rather hear a fine Irish fairy tale and sit. That'll sit on your stomach a whole lot better, yeah. Thank you. Or maybe he'd like to hear a bit of a tale as when we've been traveling about and he's been doing his preaching. Like one time we were crossing the creek and he turned his ankle on a stone and down he goes into the water and all of that and he has to take on his clothes Maggie. off. <laughs> no. Well, one time he was preaching in this little meeting house and as he's preaching, a little dog comes in and sits at his feet. And when he starts to sing, the little dog sings too. <laughs> I think the dog did a better job. Man. <laughs> No more of these interruptions. I want you to tell your tale. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to listen. Yes, sir. Dear Hit, Slanch Yagasir Kuga. Maggie, none of that Irish tongue of yours. Speak the good mother tongue of England. Not the top of my mind. Maggie. I'm not saying sir, I was just telling the lady that. <laughs> what I said to you in my own language was good evening, health and long life to all of you. And you're here to hear about who and what I am. Well, my name is Maggie, you know that already. And I'm indentured to the master there, you know that already too. And sure, and I'm from Ireland. And if you can't tell that by now, you've no more sense than a rabbit. Hey. I, I'm not saying, sir, I was just telling you that. <coughs> well, I am from Ireland, born and bred there, raised, and when I was old enough, married. Married to a man named Robert Delaney. My Robbie was a good man. He was a fine man. A man that took pride in the work of his hands and everything he did so that he was never ashamed before any living soul. Robbie was a farmer. And sure, and I farm the land with you. And it's hard work when you get your living from the ground, is it not? Hard on man and beast. 
But isn't it true that the back must slave to feed the belly? And though the days were long and hard, and sometimes the years were lean, and what man here doesn't know of those? Still, there was the better times, too, when we'd sit before our peat fire in that little stone hut and have the sweetness of it between us because of it. Now, we didn't know the land we work in Ireland, sure none of us do. You see, it's all owned by the great lords, and you have to pay a rent and a tithe in order to be able to work the land. And there wasn't a lot left after we paid the tithing, but there was enough most years. There was enough to put food on the table and a roof over our head and to keep the wolf away from the door, and that's all anyone needs to be happy, is it not? Seven children I bore to Robbie in the years we were there together. But four of them rested in the ground and only three were alive to us. Colin was our oldest. He was about ten summers old with a thatch of wild hair and a twinkle in his eye and a little dimple right there just like his pie. And then Brenna. Brenna was our, our golden child. She was about six summers old with hair the color of a sunset and eyes the color of a summer sky and a smile that would bring the very sun up in the morning. Oh, she was her father's pride and joy. And then Colleen was the babe. And although she was only a season old, she was already the joy and the laughter of our lives. We were happy there, all together and contented. We had no thought of ever leaving it, especially to come here to your colonies, but they say that the most sudden changes take place on the most unlikely of days. And isn't it true that it's only the good Lord himself who knows the twist and lay of the road in front of us? Well, Ireland is a poor country, you see. Made poor still by England having our fingers and everything we does to keep us that way. But there come about a time that there was a crying out from the colonies here for the good Irish linen. You ladies know of what I speak, do you not? Sure, it's the finest in the world. And you see, England had her own linen, so she didn't care anything about it. So it was, there was coin to be made in the growing and the making and selling of it from Ireland. And it started in the towns at first, and then it began to grow out into the countryside. And then that had the means was always looking for more land to lease for the growing of it. And when they did that, it began to drive the rents up. Rack rents, they were called, so rack rents. Sometimes two, sometimes three times as much as what the poor farmers had ever paid before. And when it did that, it began to drive us off. That's what happened to us. I remember the day they brought the new lease for us to sign. And the, and the amount that they wanted from us now, twice as much as what we'd ever paid. More than the land itself had ever produced. Bobby tried to argue with them, but what do you say when you don't own your own land? And when we said we couldn't pay it, where they had a grand hurry for us to get out. And they stood about in the yard and at the doorway as we gathered everything we could out of our huts and carried it to the road. And then they burned our house behind us so we wouldn't go back. As I stood there in the road that day with my children clutching at my skirts and the things I owned scattered about me in the road, I wondered what would become of us, what would become of us because that was the only life we'd ever known. Well, I won't tell you all the days that followed. What with this walking and walking and walking and selling everything that we brought with us in order to be able to buy food and trying to find a new place to lease or work for Robbie, which wasn't to be had. And we did that till we came to the town of Straban and there we stopped. We'd already sold almost everything we had. The food was almost gone. The children weary and weeping and no place to lay our heads but the hard ground. In the morning, Robbie and Colin would get up and they would go into town and they would try to find work to get coin to buy bread for one more day. And I would take Brenna and the baby and go door to door and I would beg for a, a crust of bread, a bowl of milk, just anything to feed the children one more day. But the people there were poor as we. They had little to spare and we weren't the only ones on the road to baby. And so there was more than one night that the children had nothing but tears to fill their empty bellies to sleep by. Robbie and I were at the end of ourselves, not knowing what we were going to do. And that's about the time he comes back from town one day. Oh, he's all in a grand way. He's so excited because he's met a man, a man who is an agent for a ship that's docked at Derry. And it's on its way to the colonies, and it's taking people with them, and 
given us food. If we just make a mark on the paper, you see, that says we work for five years once we get here. Work for five years, I asked Robbie. And then what happens to us? Why, Maggie says he will be free. <coughs> Who says I? We'd be free to starve over there the way we're starving over here. No, Robbie, we'll stay here in Ireland and do that. Me and Maggie, he says, not like that. You see, over there, Maggie, the land is free. <coughs> it's free. And when we get free, we're going to go and get some of that land and make a place and a home that no one can ever take away from us again. Now, my mother always says, I know Thomas kind of like, because I'm always fooled out. And so I says to him, free land. Free land indeed. Broader than any who went and put this stuff and nonsense into your head. No one gives land away for free. Neil Maggie, he says, it's truth and for certain. The ship's man told me all about it himself. It is a look on his face of a good and honest man. Oh, says I, does he now? Well, there's often the look of an angel on the devil himself. Hey. I'm not saying, sir, I, I was just telling him. Let's not be unkind. No, Robbie, I says to you, no. I don't want to put my hand, my life in the hands of other men to go to another country. I don't want to sign my life away to someone as a piece of property for five years. We'll stay here in Ireland. You'll find work. We'll find more land. We've got to have hope. I never forget what he says to me that day. For doesn't he look me dead in the eye and he says, Maggie, there's hope from the ocean, but there's none from the grave. I step back and look at the faces of my children standing there, all hollow-eyed and quiet, listening. And I see how their little faces are pinched and drawn up with hunger. I bow my head. For didn't I know we had to take whatever faith was holding out in her hands to us, whether I wanted to go or not? So back in the town we went that very day, straight to the ship's man, and from there to the magistrate, and there they drew up the indenture papers for us, one for Robbie, one for myself, and one for each of the two older children, which I thought rather odd, but at six and ten they could still do some work, and in five more years they'd be able to do that much more. You've seen and ditch your papers, you know of what I'm speaking, yes? Are they French? I, <laughs> I don't think so. They've Have I wasted all of this talking to French people who don't understand? Try again, thank you. <laughs> Do you know of and ditch your papers? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, that one answered. <laughs> Have you ever seen them? No. Yeah. Yes. Ah, one. Uh, well, maybe I teach you something new anyway. The indenture papers that they draw up for us is a large piece of paper. And they write on it a promise, a contract between you and whoever you are indenturing to. To us, it was the captain of the ship. And they write the same thing at the top and at the bottom, so that there are two of them. And then everyone signs it, twice. The ship's man signed it for the captain. The magistrate marked it with a red seal. That's what makes it legal. And then they made a place in the corner for us to make a mark, because sure not a bus reader right. And then they take that paper and they cut it in half, so that the master always has one set and you always have the other. But they don't cut it straight. They cut it in and out like this. So that when you pull it apart, it has great teeth. It fits together like a puzzle. It's indented. That's why it's called an indenture paper. Hmm. Well, I thought you something new, didn't I? Don't forget your place, man. I'm not sorry, sir, but I just... <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> well, when they got through with the indenture papers, the ship's man folded his up and put them away, and he gave the other half to my husband, and he says, here, Robert, lady, you hold on to these. They're important. Didn't I know they were important? <coughs> Didn't I know when I made my mark on that paper that I'd sign myself away from Ireland forever? I knew we'd never be back again. 
And then we followed the man out the door and into the streets and back to where he was from. But it was different. Because you see, when we walked in that door, nobody owned us but God. We were our own people. But when we walked back out that door, we were nothing but the property of another man. And that was a bitter, bitter moment. But the bitterness was made better by the ship's man who did he promised. He gave us food and victuals, enough for several days. And he says, now, here is where you need to go in Derry. This is the name of the ship and the day that she sails, and you need to be there. So the next morning, we got up to walk to Derry. For sure, we had no reason to stay there anymore. And after walking for many days, we came to Derry. We went straight to the docks, and there was the ship, just like they told us. The Sally, she was called. Oh, what a grand ship she was. And the sailors crying out to one another and calling back and forth and carrying things on to be able to bring over here to the colony. There was people there too. People like you. Fine people. People that paid a coin in order to ride on top of the boat. They were going over to the new land to find fame or fortune to start a new life. But there was people like us too people that had made a mark on a piece of paper in order to be able to find hope. <clears throat> well, we showed our papers to the sailors. They took us on board the ship and over to the ladder that went down into the hold. And they said, now get down in there with the other indentures and don't come back up again. So we did. We went down that ladder in that darkness and misery we would be at end for the next several weeks. You ever been down in the hold like that? You know, you're fine folk, you wrote on the top, didn't you? <laughs> well, let me tell you what it was like for those of us beneath your feet. The hold in the ship was a room in the belly, as far down as you could go. Not quite as long as this room. Not quite from me to the tables in the back. But maybe for the last row there. But it's only as wide as two tall men laid head to head. And it's only this tall. So you can't stand up in it. You've always got to be down. Like such. On your hands or knees or sitting or laying in whatever little area you could find. And by the time we sailed, there was a hundred of us in there. Mostly men. But some women and children and whatever little things they brought along with them. There's no light down in that hole. The only light comes from the ladder that goes to the deck, but you're not allowed to go up that. You see, they're afraid you'll mutiny and take over the ship or throw yourself overboard in the misery you're in. Every day we were given a bowl of gruel or porridge, some stale ship's biscuits, a pint, a pint and a half of water. The children were given half of that, the baby none at all. And down at the end of the room where the ladder was, down at the bottom of that ladder, they put two buckets. That was for our waste, for a hundred people. And they emptied them once a day. So you can imagine that it doesn't take very long for what's in those buckets to begin to come over the sides. And it mixes with the swill of the water of where you're sitting in the floor. And as it creeps across the floor, it brought with it sickness and disease and then death. Before we had been at sea even a fortnight, the very old and the very young began to die. And among them are the old little cubby. You see, well too well did I know that my milk had dried up, and the gruel that they gave us had no strength in it for the babe. So when the fever came on her in the night, she had neither strength nor will to fight back. And she died there in my arms on the third day. That was a grievous thing. But more grievous it was when the sailors came and took her from me and carried her up to the deck and threw her over the side and into the water from the grave. You see, she wasn't cradled in the arms of our home men. They were in Ireland with her brothers and sisters surrounding her. But she was lost and alone in the wildness of that sea. She weren't the only one that died. Pity more it was the mothers who came on board the ship whose little ones were still inside them and whose time came on them while we made that trip. Not one baby survived the birth of them. And there was only one mother that didn't show. 
it's in, into the grave of the sea with its little ones. I tell you, fine folk, that down in that hold, in that blackness, in the darkness we were in, was such a time of misery, such a time of, of not knowing who you were or what you were. You're everything that's inside of you that makes a man, your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your very soul dies. And you sit there in that darkness and you hear the people around you in the blackness crying out to whatever God or mother or whoever it is that they're crying out for for mercy. You hear the rats chewing on dead and live alike. And you just wait for the end to come, no matter when or where it does. Well, the end finally did come, and we sailed into the Charleston port, and there we stopped. And they brought us up from below the deck and scrubbed us off with a hard brush to get the filth off of us. And then they gave us old clothes to wear and stood us all around the top while the captain put out the notice that he had indentures for sale. And they let the men, and well, mostly the men, come on and see him. And they would come on and walk past you as you stood around the top of the deck and they'd feel your muscles or they'd look at your teeth. Sometimes they'd make you step out, you know, and walk back and forth like you were a cow or a horse at the market. Some were asked if they know a skill or a trade, could they read or cipher? And for those, sometimes it went better, but not for all. Workers for the farm is what they wanted most. And it didn't matter what you could or couldn't do as long as you could work with the farm. Now, there were men who came on the ship who were called soul drivers. Soul drivers were men who came on to buy a group or a lot of indentures and take them out into the countryside and sell them where they could make a profit over the 12 or 15 pounds they paid for the rest of us on the ship. Robbie and I were bought by a soul driver almost right away. We'd never given any thought that the children would be sold with us because that was what we'd been told, but that was not true. Our Colin and Brenna were each bought by a different man and taken away and off the ship. And I'm going to tell you, mothers, it's a hard thing to sit there and listen to your children crying for you. And you not know where they're not going, or who has them, or how they can be treated, or if you'll ever see them again. And I can still hear the sobbing of the mothers and the crying of those children as they're being taken away. Some of them are having to be carried away, they were that young. And what of the very youngest of all? They took them from their mothers and handed them over the side of the ship to anyone that was walking by on the docks like they were unwanted puppies. Because you see, you can't work as hard when you're having to watch a child. And so they got that out of the way so that you could work harder while you were indentured. And I've not seen Conan and Brenna since that day, nor am I likely to. For didn't we find out on that day that the papers that the children signed did not hold them for five years the way we were told, but holds them until they're 21. And at six and 10, I'll likely never see them again now, will I? I don't know where they are, if they're alive or dead, but the good Lord knows, and it's in his hands I had to put them because my arms weren't big enough to hold on to them any longer. Well, Robbie and I was gathered together with the others, the, the, that the soul driver had bought. We were led out into the countryside. I don't know which way we went. But we stopped at every little village or town that we went through, and the sign would go up that there were adventures for sale, and we would wait for a day or two while the men and sometimes the women would come in from the different farms. Now, Robbie was bought in one of the very first places that we stopped, bought by a man who was looking for a group of men to work on his farm, but not me. There wasn't time for us to say goodbye to one another or touch or anything like that, but we did look at one another, and I know in my eyes there was anguish. 
But in Robbie's eyes, there was a peace and a calm. And as they led him away, and I watched him as they took him down the street, right before he went out of sight, he turned around and he grinned that devil grin he had at me one more time, and he nodded his head. And I know what he was saying. He was saying, I'll tell you, Maggie. I'll tell you. Courage. Courage, Maggie. We'll be together again one day, I promise. Then he was gone. And I was alone. And I tell you, at that moment, I could have laid right on that road and died. Oh, I wish I'd never listened to that man. I wish I'd never listened to what he wanted to do. I'd be back in Ireland with everything that I had that belongs to me, but now here I am in a country full of strangers, and I know nothing to no one, and nothing is mine. Let that be a lesson to you, ladies. <clears throat> Poor gentleman. I hate you. I'll do the preaching. I'm not saying, sir, I'm just warning them. Well, as the days went by, the parting grew easier to bear. And at last, I was bought myself, about a fortnight later, by a gentleman who was always also looking for people to work in the field. And I don't think he was very happy at getting a woman in, and I wish one in that, but that's too bad. I was one of the best that was left, and that's what he got. And so my papers were signed, and I had my first master. Now, my new master was a gentleman farmer, wore fine clothes, rode a blood horse, had a carriage, had beautiful things in his house that I didn't see until the very end, but I heard about them. Now, I will not call him a kind man, nor will I call him a generous man. But I will call him a fair enough master. Because as long as you did what you were supposed to, and you did it at the time that he asked, he wasn't cruel or unjust to you in any way. But he had a fine kind of wife that thought too much of herself that was proper, and had a tongue so sharp it could clip a head tight. I'm not saying, sir, I was just saying the baby here. Oh, she was a harsh and unwieldy woman, more than made up for the fairness of her husband. Nothing was ever right that was done for that woman. Her poor little maids I see all the time, with her cheeks all red, all slapped, where she's not happy with how they've done the tea, or how they've done her hair, or how they've done the house. She was a hateful woman. All of us in the field, we stayed out of our way to get away from that tongue. And proud, whew, proud as a whitewashed pink. I hate you. I'm not saying, sir. I was just telling him that. Get on with it now. Well, glad I was I wasn't put in the house with her. But I was sent to the fields and I spent my days as I had done many times in Ireland, going up and down the roads, picking rocks. The only difference was now, you see, I can't stop to get a drink if I'm thirsty. I can't stop to rest if I'm tired, not without the overseer telling me that I can or cannot do those things. I found fast enough when I made that mark on that paper, I hadn't just signed my labor away. I signed my very body and soul to someone else instead. Here we worked six days a week, from the sun rising in the morning till it set at night, and on Sunday we worked to grow our food in our own little place. Every night we were put to sleep in two sheds, one for the men and one for the ladies. That was to stay the temptation between us. When that like trying to net fish with a ladder. <laughs> I'm not saying, sir, I was just telling you that. Well, among my fellow servants were those that were lazy and idle. And they spent more time in trying to get out of the work that they did than putting in the work they finally ended up doing. And I wondered who they were. But it didn't take me very long to find it out. They were His Majesty's seven-year passengers. You know what I'm talking about? Are you in the colonies or not? <laughs> this is no, that is yes. Do you know what His Majesty's seven-year passengers are? No. Thank you. They're the scum and the filth from the prisons in London. Sent over by His Majesty himself so he doesn't have to feed and care for them anymore to serve seven years as indentured servants over here. Woo! Rogues, pickpockets, thieves, oh, and among the ladies, strumpets no less, who brought their work and foul diseases right along with them. Oh, they were a rough group to be sure. 
And every single one of them was suffering from a double dose of original sin. Right. <laughs> I, I'm not saying sure, I was just telling him that. Well, all that stinking group did was talk about trying to get back to England. And faith don't even I know what would happen to them if they made it all the way back. You see, once you get sent over by his magistrate, if you get all the way back to England and get caught a second time, well, it's no mercy for you this time. You'd be taking a trot on that three-legged mayor. English magnet. You'd get hung. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't stop them from running off. Oh, my no, oh, my no. Every now and then there would be one that would disappear. Ah, what a hubbub there would be. And the mistress would be angry. And there'd be ads put in the gazettes. And they'd send out hunting parties trying to find them. Oh, there'd be so much that would go on. Sometimes they got caught. <clears throat> and when they brought them back, they would hang them from the whipping post. Thrash them. All the rest of us would have to stand and watch so that we would learn a lesson from it. Then the magistrate would be called and he would take their papers and he would add more time into their years. Not just for the time they'd been gone. Double the time that they were gone. Plus whatever money the master had to pay to get them back again. So sometimes when they ran away, they had seven years. And when they got back, they got seven more for a total of 14. But that didn't stop them. And sometimes they didn't come back. And we didn't know if they were alive or dead or what would happen to them. But I heard blood current stories at night around the fires when the tongues would wag about the things that the master could do to you with them. They were probably just stories. Well, I was there for almost three years. And at the end of the third year, the master himself got ill, and a great illness it was. And though the doctors came and went, they couldn't save him, and at last he died. And in just a day or two, there came from the town men in fine clothes and merchants to speak to the mistress. And we thought that they had come to tell her how sorry that they were. But when they left that afternoon, we could hear her weeping and waving all the way out to the sheds. Now, if you were Irish like me, you know that we've got a saying. The dead men tell no tales. But there's plenty you can learn in the Wake House if you listen. And this is what came out of the Wake House. You see, the master had lived a fine and wealthy life, to be sure. But he lived it on the money of other men. And now that he was dead and gone, they were there to collect, and there was no money to be had. And so everything and everyone was going to have to be sold in the days to come in order for the debt to be taken care of. Now that was a frightening thing for us. Sure, the master had not been kind, but he had been just and fair. And now we face the selling block and a new master. Who knew where he would go or what would happen to you? Well, the day finally came. Oh, what a crowd there was. People had come from miles and miles away, not only just to buy, but maybe just to look at all the fine things in the house. They sold all of us first. And then they kept us to one side until the new master came to get us. Then they sold all the things of the farm. And then they began to carry all the beautiful things out of the house. That's when I finally got to see them. And I look over and the widow is standing there, wringing her hands and crying. Her little children are clutching at her skirts. And I'm thinking to myself, now what's that woman going to do tonight? She's got no place to lay her head, no lamp to light. I thought she was crying because all of her pretty things were going. But that wasn't it. Because what do you suppose they do once they sell everything and there's still money that's owed? But take that woman's children one by one and put them on the block and sell them as indentured servants. And no amount of crying by that mother or sobbing by those children stopped them from being sold till they were 21. Now doesn't that bring back the hard memories of my own child being taken away? And I look over there at the woman and she's standing there and crying and the big tears are rolling down her face and for a moment I, I felt a stir of pity in my heart but it passed quick enough because I didn't care for the woman one whit. Right. <laughs> I'm not saying so I'm just telling you that. Well now that that was all over I'm thinking that we're done and that it will all be finished but before I could get that thought out of my head, 
The men who are owed the money go to the widow and begin to talk to her. And the next thing I know, they've got her by the arms. And they're dragging her through the block. She's going, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know what it is? There's still money that's owed. And the only thing left to sell is her. put up there and I know that little the little maids behind me was really happy to see her having to be put up there. And I'm thinking to myself as she stands on the block, well no, it won't be so hoity toity anymore for you with it tonight. And I was glad she was being so hey, God's true, sir, I'm not just saying this time. I hope she got a mean master. Maggie, you hold your tongue or I'll give you Sunday sermon twice again. I've heard it three times, sir. Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> I think I could preach it better. <laughs> if I hear a new one. Get on with it. <laughs> well, when they put her up on the block, there is a man in the crowd who calls out, How many years? How many years do you sell the woman as an indenture for? The man that was holding her by the arm says, Sir, we can sell her for up to 39 years to cover what her husband still owes. When he says that, she shuts her mouth and stops her wailing and crying. And when she opens it up again, the words that fell out, no fine lady ought to know. Woo! Vulgar talk, street language, shocked all of us in the silence, all of her friends and neighbors, and all of us too. Till I hear this, the little strumpets behind me start to snicker. And they whisper around, and it comes all the way around back to me, and you know what it is. That whether he knew it or not, our master had married one of those women off the streets of London, made her out to be a fine woman, and here she was, no better than the rest of us this whole time. Oh, 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 oh. oh how I did laugh at that. And I look out, and there's all of her friends and neighbors standing there with their eyes all bugged open and their mouths hanging open, looking like a bunch of dumb sheep. And I wanted to say to them all, so bad, what else do you expect from a pig but a grunt? <laughs> I'm not saying, sir, I was just telling you that. Well, with that, it was over. And those of us that had been bought together were tied by the neck and led out to the road, which I thought was no goodwill. The master had already gone on. We were there with two overseers, and we were not allowed to speak to one another, so we didn't know where we were going. But one of the pretty young things that was with us made up to an overseer. By nighttime, we all knew where we were going. We were going to a man who had a very large plantation about a day and a half walk away. Now I won't tell you much about that place because I have tender ears in the audience and I don't want to sicken you on your stomach after just eating. But I will tell you that what I thought was hard in the first place that I was at was nothing but a gentle journey where I went now. You see, here it was, we worked seven days a week from before the sun rose in the morning till long, long after it set at night. No place to sleep except for the hard ground. And many times you lay down right where you were because you were too tired to look for another place. Here it was, we were left in the hands of overseers every day who carried whips in their hands, beat anybody that they wanted to without any fear of it, took a pleasure with any woman that they wanted without any fear. Here's where I saw man and woman alike, slave and indenture, die under the lash, or under burdens that were too heavy for their weakened state to carry. Here's where I saw some that crawled into the woods and took their own lives so that they were not caught up in the misery that they were in before. Here's where I saw some try to run away, and the ones that did run away almost were always were caught. And when they were brought back, they were hung from the whipping post and whipped until the back of their neck to the soles of their feet looked like a piece of bloody meat. What about those that grew too ill or too weak to work? The master would put them in a wagon and take them out into the woods somewhere and dump them and come back and we never saw them again because he didn't want the care of them, you see. Here's where I saw cruelty done man to man that I'd never seen before. And I was afraid that I would never make it out my year in order to see my Robbie again. But there come a day when I hadn't been there very long. And I was doing my work, and next to me was a servant that I did not know. But all day long, as we worked side by side, I feel his eyes on me. 
watching, looking. He made me nervous the way he was staring at me. Finally, he got up close enough and he says, Maggie Delaney, don't you know me? Oh, what a start I had. I had not heard my name put together like that since leaving the ship. And I look at his face as we're working side by side and, and doesn't the dawning come. He's one of the young Irishmen that come with us when we came across in that dark hole together. Glad I was to see him. He was the only one I had seen of my own people. So as we worked side by side, my mind went back to those days, and I began to remember that I thought he was sold with Robbie in that first place we stopped. And so I asked him, Robbie, my Robbie, do you know of him? And he nodded his head. Oh, I thought my heart would jump clean out of my chest for joy. And I asked him again, quick, do you know where he is? He nodded a second time. But before my heart could take that second leap, he says to me, sure I do, Maggie. More's the pity. Your Robbie's been dead and gone these two years together. And I thought I don't understand him. And don't I get angry at him and I say, no, no. Robert Delaney that I'm speaking of, you're thinking of another. Neil Mighty, he says, it's your Robbie I'm thinking of. I was with him when he caught the fever at that place we were at. I helped bury him when he died, God rest his soul. <coughs> I thought I took a blow in my chest. And wasn't it my heart that broke out and fell on the ground that day? And then everything went deaf and dumb to the world and everything began to spin around and around and around and my legs wouldn't hold me anymore and I crumpled down to the ground. And as I lay there wild with my weeping, all I could think is that Robbie can't, can't be dead. We only have this much more time and we're going to be together and finding our own place. We can't be Ted. I don't know how long I lay there on the ground, long enough for the overseers to see me. The first I knew of that man was a blow I took across my back and then him pulling to me to my feet and shouting in my face. I couldn't understand him, but I know what he wanted. He wanted me to get back to work. How could I? How could I just go back to work when everything I had now was gone? What hope did I have in my life at all? I don't remember most of the days that followed. What with me trying to do my work, and my eyes red and swollen with my weeping, and every step I took, every beat of my heart, the voice inside says, alone. Maggie, you're alone. You have no one. You have nothing. You have no hope. But one day when I was working and my heart was beating that message out to me, my mind answered back and said, no, you don't have a husband anymore. You don't know where your children are, but you do have a home. You know where Ireland is, and that's where you need to be. You need to go home. Ireland is calling you. The more I thought about that, the more I decided that I needed to go home. And so one night when I lay myself down, my feet just picked me back up again and I ran away. Oh, I was caught quick enough, brought back and whipped the way I knew I would be. But as soon as I healed a little, I ran away a second time, caught right away and brought back. Then I ran away a third time. And this time I wasn't just running really nilly any way. You see, I knew what I was going to do. I was going to find the ocean. And in the ocean, I would find a port. And in the port, I would find a ship going to Ireland. And I would do whatever I had to do to get on there. I was going home, home where I belong. Oh, wasn't that like 
trying to send a goose on a mission to the Fox's den. How foolish was I to think that I could find my way through road and trail without getting caught again. I didn't even know where the ocean was. I didn't know where I was. But I made it many, many days before I got caught that third time. Taken into that little town and turned over to the magistrate who had me whipped and then put in the jail while they went to find out who I belonged to. And as I sat there in that jail with those scurvy others, I thought to myself, Maggie, you're such a fool. You ain't ever going home. You're never going home. And you've got nothing to live for anymore. And so I decided when I was taken back and beaten in the way I knew I would be this time, that I would find a way to crawl off and take my own life. But as you can see, that's not quite what happened, is it? Or I wouldn't be standing here talking to you tonight. You see, the master sent back my papers to the magistrate, and he said that he wanted no more of a grieving Irish widow who had run away for the third time and couldn't do a day's worth of work. So he told the magistrate, he said, you do what you think is right in the way of punishment, sell it for what you can, and send the money back to me. And so that's what he did. First thing the magistrate did was take my papers. I told you I'd run away three times, then. So I got two years for that first runaway. Two years for that second runaway, and then six years for the last one. So now instead of one year to finish, I've got ten more. Then he took me out front and he had me held at the whipping post, public whipping post, and there they gave me 40 lashes less one. That's as many as you can give a runaway. And when I healed enough from that, he gave me one more gift. He gave me this. A metal collar, a neck ring, they call this. This is to put on and to remind all of you that I am a criminal and a lawbreaker and a runaway. And it is to remind me that I am nothing but a piece of property that belongs to someone else. And then they took me to the market and had me sold. And I stood there all day long with my eyes on the ground watching people walk back and forth in front of me. No one ever stopped to see how much I was. I don't blame them. Look what I'm wearing. Would any of you want to be that? You don't want a criminal that you have to watch and take care of. Who wants that? Who wants to be burdened with that? And so I stood there all day long. And as it got later and later, the price that the jail man called out got lower and lower because I think he was afraid that no one would say anything and he'd have to take me back to the jail again. But long, long late in the day, finally in front of me, I hear a low, gruff voice say, how much? And I raise my eyes off the ground just long enough to see the clothing of a common man, a man who's a wagoner, a delivery man, if you want to say so, that would carry goods from place to place and town to town. And because the jailman was afraid he would lose the only person that was interested all day, they struck the bargain and my papers were signed and I was following my new master across the market toward the wagon where his beasts were. And as I followed along behind him, I'm wondering to myself that perhaps because he is a common man, like myself, that perhaps we would get along better. But when we get to the wagon, he reaches in the back of it and pulls out a length of rope and cuts it. He ties one end of it to the collar and he ties the other end of it to the wagon and he says, now let's see you run away from me, Missy. And he walked forward to where the beasts were standing and he cracked the whip over the top of their head and we moved out into the marketplace, crossing it the way we were. Me still wondering all the while if he might be a kinder man once we got to know each other. But as we crossed the market, the young lads of the town, seeing me tied the way I was, decided it was fun to pick up stones and filth and throw them at me and watch me try to dodge the best I could. And do you know what that beast of a man said when he saw them doing that? He threw back that great shaggy head he had and he said, be careful boys, and don't harm the goods on the wagon. That was all care he took me. And as I followed him out the other side of the town that day, I thought to myself, whoa, Maggie, sure enough the devil's got a brother, he's been sold to him, and in God's truth, I wasn't far off from that. Maggie. 
I'm not saying, sir. Oh, I was just telling I want you to tell them. They must understand that he is just such a man. Tell them. Make haste, but tell them. As much as I want, sir. <laughs> this man was a hard man. A cruel man. With a taste for strong drink and a temper that went with it. Four men of oxen that he had that pulled that wagon, and he loved them like children. He called them my babies, my boys, and they each and every one had a name and followed him around wherever he went. He carried the whip, curled up in his hand, that he would crack over the top of their heads when we traveled, but he never touched them with it. No, no, you see, he was afraid they wouldn't love him enough to work. He didn't worry about that with me. My name was never more than Winch or Hussey or a few more names that I won't say because there's ladies present. And every day and every day I felt the back of his hand across my face or the whip on my legs or shoulders just because he felt like doing it or wanted something to beat on. Here was the man I had to serve. Here is the man that I cooked the meals for and stood by while he ate because he gave me only scraps. Here is the man that I had to load and unload the wagon for to help hook and unhook the beast to do whatever he said, whenever he said to do it. And always, always follow the wagon tied to the back of it like a cur dog everywhere we went. Now the only thing he loved more than those beasts was a strong drink. And there was many, many a day that I sat outside the tavern or an alehouse while he sat inside and drank his fill. Now, if the day had been good and the prophets were fine, he'd come out and just have curses for me. But if the day was bad, the credit not enough, or the money not far enough, then he would come out just looking for something to play on. And guess what he had to take that temper out on? And I had the bumps and the bruises and the marks for the next days to show him. I knew this is where I was going to die. Because didn't I find out that he killed the one before me? Her just 19 years old, he beat her to death because she couldn't keep up. <clears throat> what chance did I have? As the days grew colder and colder and I have nothing but rags and bare feet to walk in, I feel myself getting weaker and weaker and I know that it will just be a matter of time before all that temper comes out one day and he'll kill me where I am. But I didn't care. I didn't care. What do I have to live for now? What hope do I have in my life? Do I have someone that I'm going to go and build a place and a home that no one will take away from us again? No. I have nothing. I have no one. And so I just waited as the days went by until the day would come until he'd take my life. Well, it finally came. Oh, the day was so cold and wet, and there I was, crouched underneath the wagon outside the tavern again, shivering and shaking. My teeth were chattering, so I think if I'd set them together, my whole head would have rattled clear off. My feet were bruised and swollen and cut from the ice and the muck and mire in the road that I'd been in. prophets had been bad that day. And so he came out far too early. And when he did, he came out just looking for something to beat on. And I remember he jerked me out from beneath the wagon, slapped me across the face, said, now keep up. Went forward and called to the beast, and we moved out into the growing darkness down into the road. Me stumbling, sliding, slipping all over behind him, trying to stay to my feet, but, but I was too weak. And so as we would walk down the road, I would slide and I would fall and catch myself on the back of the wagon because I knew if I ever missed, if I ever went down, I'd never get up again. But at last I missed. And down face first, I went into the muck and mire of that road and I was drugged by the neck, uh, by the collar like this, until he could get the beast stuck. And when he came back and found me on my hands and knees trying to get back up out of the mud, all that rage came out at once. And he hit me such a blow in the middle of my back 
that he knocked me face first back down into the muck, and there I lay with no breath at all. And I guess I didn't move fast enough, because he began to kick and to beat and to scream as I lay there on the ground, and I knew, I knew that he was going to kill me there. And I, I did the best I could. I tried, I tried to curl away from the blows, but the way I was tied, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And finally, finally I gave up, and I just lay there and let him do. Now the strangest thing was, is the more he beat, the more that flame of life that's in your breast, mine began to die, it began to flicker, flicker and go down, and things began to get dark. And as it did, I, I quit feeling the blows. I quit hearing what was happening. It was like it was a long, long way away, but I didn't feel the cold and the muck in my air or anything. But all I could think of was Robbie. And how we had such dreams when we came here. We were going to get a place and a home. And this is all that's going to come of it. Just before the blackness closed me out, I heard another voice. And then I heard shouting. And I thought perhaps it was St. Peter that had come. <laughs> but then I heard and felt no more. Now, I thought I had died. But when I opened my eyes again, instead of seeing the pearly gates of heaven, I see a fire. And next to it, an eye all in black. And I think to myself, oh, Maggie, it wasn't St. Peter's the devil himself who's come. <laughs> The truth of it was, as this traveling minister had been passing by, seeing the wagoner beating at something on the road, he crossed to see what it was. And when he saw it was a woman on the ground, he shouted at him to stop and taking his arm. But I didn't belong to him now, did I? Whose property was I to be to death? And so the, man, the minister had to buy me in order to be able to save my life that night. And I've been with him now more than two years, traveling everywhere he goes. And he's a good man for a preacher. <laughs> and he's a, a kindly man, a, a generous man. For didn't he get me these fine clothes from a farmer whose servant had died? She didn't need them anymore. I have shoes too, but I'm not allowed to wear them except for when it's cold, which doesn't happen down here very often. But he doesn't want to have to buy anymore. And he's, he's a kindly man, for he's not lifted his hand to me one time in the two years we've been together, though I know he's been sorely tempted to do so. <laughs> but he does preach at you something awful. And there are some men God never meant to see. <laughs> not seeing, sir. I just didn't just know. Know. But you can tell he's a poor man by his clothes. He's got no need of a sermon. And so he tries to sell me everywhere we go. So I never know what tomorrow will bring. I never know what person I might go home with tonight. What new place I may be laying in my head. But it doesn't matter. You see, my heart has come back up off the ground again. And even though I'm not happy, I'm more contented than I was. But you know, madam, there's ever a night when I sit before the fire and stare into the flames that doesn't my heart and my mind take me winging back to Ireland again. Suddenly I'm there, sitting in my own hut with my peat fire in front of me. 